Hello everyone, uh, we're here in the second Talking Dogs with Dante, this time with Andrew. Um, and we're so happy for this one. Um, I think we're going to be um, having fun today. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about his judging and his career in dogs, of course, and uh, was more excited. So um, let's start with Ante. I don't know where Andrew went now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was so nice that you said we have Andrew and that he has just gone away. He left. So I don't know. If, yeah, I, I don't know if this is a part of the plan. Andrew, <laughs> we're live. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. I think so. I think, I think he just triggered like he was going to do it and then now he's not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think back, so. Back, so. Uh, here you go, guys. <laughs> you guys can start. Andrew, do you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Did, did you realize that? Did you realize that we have gone live, <laughs> and Christian started talking like, and our guest today is Andrew Brace, and then you have just gone away. And I was thinking, okay, here talking dogs to Ante goes to hell. So, are you in focus now? Yes, and we are live, and people are watching, and you are there. Are we live? Yes, we are live. <laughs> we have been live also without you when you have gone away somewhere. Okay. So are you ready can, now? How come your picture isn't really in focus for me? I don't know. Me, I don't okay. see anything. My glasses are complete. Okay, well, don't deal with anything. Okay, do you hear so me now? Yeah, I can. So, are we throughout the broadcast? We are live. Are see, throughout the broadcast, are we going to see these little comments on the right of the screen? Yes, and if there will be something important, I will ask Valentina to say it to me, and then I will ask you that. Are you ready that we start? I mean, we have started already, but well, l listen. Um, if before we start, yes. Um, I, think I mean, we, we started. I think, I think okay, well, right. Now that we've started, then we should clarify something for the viewers, assuming that we have some. And I'm looking at this thing, I guess we have some viewers. Um, because since I've known you, you have yes. persuaded me to wear flip flops and shorts. Yes. You have managed to get me into the sea at Rogaznica the first time since I was seven years old. Yes. Incredibly, incredibly, you have actually taken me to eat at McDonald's. Yes. And now you where are we going? Me into... Where are we going with this? And now you have cornered me into doing this interview with no prior knowledge whatsoever of the questions. So this, my dear nephew, is your greatest achievement to date. And if it is a total <laughs> disaster, we know who yes. to blame. Okay. I'm well, you yours. know, okay. You know, normally, you know, these normal people, which I don't consider to be one of them, uh, you know, they would say normal? that I don't know the biggest. Yes, normal. You know how they say there are normal people. Sometimes they say there are normal people. I don't know. And, uh, you know, they say usually like, uh, oh, my biggest achievement is when I became a father or whatever, mother, sister, brother, whatever. So you want to say that my biggest achievement in my 40 years of my life is to get you come to this interview without sending you the questions in advance. Please clarify that. Yeah, that's absolutely what I was saying. Oh my it's God, Andrew Brace. It's, okay. it's a miracle. Anyhow, yes, it's a miracle of life. Okay, anyhow, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to everybody who was watching our first show uh, one week ago. Thank you for all the great comments and messages and everything. Because of you, we have decided to continue this show. And um, I hope, and I mean, that's what I was talking with Christian and Jovana, is that we will try to have this show regularly now, at least as, as long as there are no dog shows anywhere in the world, always on Friday at the same time, uh, with some interesting guests. Uh, so I hope that that will be fine. Uh, well, Andrew already said um, what I wanted to say is that, um, uh, well, Andrew is more or less, and I mean, you, most of you know it quite well, 
he's uh, not just a friend to me he's almost like a family already and uh, he's one of these few people that i really trust in my life and when i want to when i write a text or when i want to make uh, something uh, public uh, some status or i want to publish some photo or something i always ask him for the advice before i i put it public and uh, when i started this project obviously and when i decided mika would be my my first guest of course i sent him a message and i said Oh, I'm so excited, excited, I'm going to do this and uh, and he said to me, this is going to be a disaster. How you can make an interview with a person without sending questions uh, in advance? This is going to be horrible. I would never accept to be your guest in these terms and so on and so on. So you can imagine that I have been really, really excited to have my first show after he told me that. But, uh, well, once when the show has finished, uh, he said to me, oh, that was not so bad. And actually, after two days, I uh, found my uh, courage and I asked him if he would consider to do it. And um, he has he has agreed, which uh, uh, I think it's amazing. And um, I think, Andrew, uh, a lot of people know you, but I think that uh, maybe with me, uh, you can show also this other side of yourself uh not this you know super professional judge and this and that and only dogs and only this and only that i think we can uh, enjoy a little bit of of uh, real you the 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 andrew that i know and uh, i'm sure that that everybody who is now with us is going to enjoy that anyhow so we are ready to start are you nervous are you excited i'm terrified you should not be listen i before we start i'm going to give you a little treat something that i'm going to i think it's going to cheer you up a little bit so that you're not uh, terrified anymore uh christian can we have the first video please okay sounds good let me give me one second even two if you want so first one first one slight technical hitch no, no, no. no, I just no, no it's okay. We like it this way. We don't, we don't like anything to be super professional and boring. Yeah, it's not that. It's not that easy. So let's see. Okay, then I'm gonna go to oh, the video. Pandita. Pandita. Let's see if she will speak. Give me a minute. I have so many that I have to okay. find. It. Uh, okay. Kristen, you're giving too many information. <laughs> Panda, 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 panda. Panda, start to speak, panda. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ante. Hi, Andrew. You know, if you guys ask me who is one of the most important in my life, I can immediately tell you guys he's the one and only Mr. Andrew Briss. Well, my guardian angel, always support me, uplift me. I'm terrible at lip reading. And bring joy to my soul. Thank you so much, Andrew, for everything. I will not trade it for anything, never. Love you both. Mwah. Okay, Andrew, did you manage to hear her? Not one word. Oh my God, <laughs> okay. Well, that's not a nice surprise if you didn't hear what she said. <laughs> uh, no, I'm uh, Christian. I, do you hear him? Sure because I heard nice. it per I I heard it perfectly and Valentina who is watching it on uh, on uh, her live stream she said she heard it perfectly. Huh. So it's only Andrew who didn't hear it uh, and it was important only that he hears it. <laughs> too bad. Uh, okay, let's see. I'm sure it was I, very Let's nice. try once again. Let's try once again. Well, obviously, but we have Let's let's see once again Andrew if you can hear it. Application. Mm. Hold on. What is it? Okay. Maybe to the post something on the screen. Okay, ready. We're gonna go. Hi everyone. Hi Ante. Hi Andrew. You know, if you guys ask me who is one of no, the I'm most not hearing anything. In my life, I can immediately tell okay, you. Okay, so let's He's the one and only, Mr. N. Don't touch anything. 
No. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm sure it was wonderful. Don't touch. Tom Panda. <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. But the point, the whole point is that you hear what she said. Uh, okay, so let's, me, let's start so with the questions. Well, I, obviously, I'm not going to imitate Panda now for you. What is with you? Uh, anyhow, Christian, you try to solve this and we try to play it once again uh, after the first questions and we see what we try to see what is the problem with Andrew, okay? Yeah, okay, uh, it sounds good. <laughs> okay, anyhow, Andrew, let's, let's start with the questions until Christian tries to solve this problem. Um, tell me, how, how is the situation at the moment in the UK with the virus? Well, it, it's very similar to where it is everywhere. You know, there, there are levels of isolation and quarantining. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, on a personal front, um, because I have my mother living with me and, and she has a, a challenged immunity, um, we, we don't leave the property. And we have groceries delivered once a week. And if mum needs to see, have a medical appointment, they come to the house. Uh, so, you know, we are effectively grown. There are people, you know, the workers are going off to work. Um, the people are doing some gloves. Um, life hasn't stopped completely, but obviously, it, you know, it's totally different. Yeah, exactly. So more or less like everywhere, everywhere else. Well, you just mentioned that you you mentioned that you live with your mom, and uh, I hope she will not mind that I say that she looks wonderful uh, for her ninety-two years. And uh, you don't move too much from home. You said also that. Um, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you one thing: Did you think uh, this year, when this all started and it started a little bit uh, before crafts, did you think that maybe going on with crafts this year was? potentially a dangerous plan? Um, to be honest, I, I did think with, with the information that seemed to be about, um, I thought they would probably cancel it. But I was wrong. Yes, that's what everybody was. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think it's generally speaking, and I mean, we spoke with, uh, with many people after crafts. I think it's actually amazing that uh, they have managed to have crafts with so many visitors and exhibitors and judges and everything, and that there has not been um, any big issue with the coronavirus after it. I think it's, it's just amazing. I think it was a huge, huge luck, uh, first of all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love when you answer with, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, tell me, let's, let's start a little bit with the history. Uh, the love between you the purebred dogs. How did that start? Um, it started when I was a kid. Um, ever since I can remember, I've just been besotted with dogs. And, you know, I never wanted a teddy bear or an action man or anything. I wanted a fluffy dog toy that I could put on a lead and take for a walk. And um, <clears throat> when I was... Okay. Uh, when I was small, my, my parents resisted um, against my dog because they said you need to be old enough, you know, to look after it, which is fair enough. Um, and then when I expressed an interest in, in like a proper pet dog, <clears throat> my mother was a little bit distressed because her father had actually shown why fox terriers. Uh, I mean, he wasn't particularly famous. They, okay. they did it on a very small scale at local shows. But mum remembers being dragged okay. around dog shows as a small child, being bored to death. And when I said, you know, <laughs> I want a pedigree dog, it was like, oh, God, no, not again. Um, but anyhow, we, in, in those days with the education system, we had um, what was known as the 11-plus examination. <laughs> Um, and this was an examination that you sat in school when you were 11 years old. And to put it crudely, like the brighter kids went to the grammar school and the not so bright kids went okay. to the secondary modern school. So anyhow, okay. luckily, I got into the, I, luckily I got into the grammar school. 
Um, so, okay, you've done very well. So now we'll buy you a new, a new bike or a music center or a tape recorder. No, I want a dog. No, 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 you don't want a dog. I want a dog. And um, you might be surprised to learn that I could be quite a persistent little child. No, um, no, no. I've never heard of it. So, so any, um, eventually in principle, they said, okay, you can have a dog. So now we have to decide what kind of a dog. Well, of course, you know, I'm, I'm a young boy. I've seen all the Lassie films. So I want, I want my own Lassie dog, don't I? I want a rough collie. Of course. Um, yes. I have a rough collie because the rough collie is too big. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I get the, the books out, these dog books that I had. So, ah, now these Shetland Sheepdogs, they look like little collies. So we'll have a Shetland Sheepdog. So we were getting a Shetland Sheepdog. And then one day, mum took me to the dentist. And when I was in the dentist's sort of waiting for the surgeon to come in, I was talking to a, a medical rep who happened to be there. And we were just making small talk. And um, anyhow, the question, this dog came up somehow. <clears throat> and... Um, he said, um, oh, he said, so you're, you're getting a dog. Okay. He, said, he said, I have a boxer. And he produced his wallet and this picture of this red and white boxer dog. And I took one look at this face. I had my filling done and I came out to the waiting room and I said to mum, forget the Shetland sheepdog, we're having a boxer. <laughs> but she said, the boxer's okay. the same size as a rough collie. We're having a boxer. And we got our first boxer. <laughs> Oh, okay. And, and, that, and, so, that, and that, that, I mean, that was that was a story in itself because um, we'd we'd allocated a local breeder um, who happened to have a red and white male puppy um, for sale. And and remember, I mean, we were going to buy, or my parents were going to buy, um, uh, a, a purely a, a a pet puppy for this eleven-year-old son. I mean, showing wasn't, you know, anything that came along. So um, okay. it just so happened that the breeders we went to see, he was the chairman and she was the secretary of her boxer club. So we picked up the puppy. Um, we paid 18 guineas for him, which was 18 pounds and 18 shillings. Um, okay. And... Um, uh, insisted that I become a, a junior member of the South Wales Boxer Club. Uh, so then I started going to, you know, the, the local boxer shows. Well, what happened then was I bought more and more of these books on boxers with my pocket money. And um, I'd seen this thing called the breed standard, you know, which describes like the perfect dog. So I'd studied yes. this breed stand. I'd studied this breed standard, and I looked at my dog, and I thought, "Well, yeah, um, I'm going to show this dog because I think he'll be a champion." Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, every every day before I went to school, and when I got back from school, I used to Bruce. The dog's name was. Oh, where is he? There he is. It's Bruce. Ah, there he is Bruce. A okay. Dog, actually. Um. <clears throat> Anyhow, one day I was taking him up to the park and there was a guy mowing the lawn at the front of his house who called over and said, oh, excuse me, you are a boxer. Um, long story short, this guy and his wife used to show boxers. Um, they no longer had any boxers. They just had one old Boston Terrier. But um, they had in their home a vast in the British Boxer Club yearbooks and Dog World Annuals. So every time I went to the park, I used to call in on them and start going through all these books. And I was like a, you know, I was like a kid in a candy store. Um, and I, I, I said to them, you know, I'm going to show Bruce, you know, because I think he can be a champion, you know. I mean, why not? So <laughs> you decided yeah. so. <laughs> Anyhow, one one evening, um, my father, who was, who was a pharmacist, a retail pharmacist, came home from work and um, he said, I've had a telephone call from this chap that you've been calling in on when you've been taking the dog to the park. And um, 
he tells me that you under, that you plan on showing Bruce. Um, I said, yeah, well, you know, I've read this breed standard and I think he's got what it takes, whatever. He said, well, the problem is he, he doesn't have what it takes. And this led my father into giving me the talk about the birds and the bees and explaining that Bruce only had one, but he should have had two. So, um, <laughs> and in those days, of course, you couldn't show monarchy dogs. They had to be entire. Yes. So poor, poor Bruce never got to see the inside of dog show. Um, I maintained the interest with the South Wales Boxer Club and because they could see how keen I was, they, they made me, they gave me a title. I became honorary veterinary steward. And in those days, oh my God. you know, every, every dog that came to the show, you had to vet in. Um, okay. But I had the job of standing there holding the soap and the towel for Peter Lonnan, who was the club vet, okay. as he went okay. over all these dogs and vet. And I thought I was so important, I would tell you, you know, vet steward. Wow. <laughs> I'd arrived. <laughs> um, yes. And then Wonderful. That, because Bruce never saw the inside of a show ring, I was so keen. I eventually... Um, I, I, I got friendly with a boxer, a boxer breeder in the West called Jean Harris. And she kind of like took me under her wing a little bit. And she'd offered me two boxers, sort of on breeding terms. Um, but parents said, there's no way we're having another dog in the house. Um, so I, I found local people that I co-owned these two bitches with. And um, I showed them a little bit. I bred a, one letter from the one bitch by a very famous dog called Champion Seafell Picasso. Bred one litter. Um, there was nothing memorable in, in, in the litter apart from one bitch who did produce a CC winner. But uh, I mean, that was my, that was the extent of sort of actual boxer activity of your as an start. exhibitor. Um, and it was, yes. you know, but, but I mean, but tell I, I, me, like, go on. Okay. I, that, that was, let's say the start. And I mean, your first dog obviously was, a, was a boxer. And then you said uh, you had a little bit involvement in the breed, but, um, later on, there are two more breeds that are, let's say, coming to your life. Um, uh, Pekinis and Beagles, if I'm right. Yeah, well, what happened then, you see, when when we lost Bruce and he died relatively young um, from leptospirosis, <clears throat> we parents agreed that we, we could have another dog, but that my sister would choose the breed. Well, by now, I, I've been fascinated. I, I've just seen these pictures of Pickens and done a little bit of reading up. Um, and and they, they're just... They fascinated me. I think I probably got a thing for fat faces, you know. Um, so anyhow, the, ne yes. the next mission was to brainwash my sister into wanting a Pekingese, um, which didn't take long. It didn't take long. Um, so <laughs> we, so we, we, we bought um, uh, a Pekingese dog from a lady in Cardiff, quite close to where I lived. Um, who had bought two puppies unseen from a breeder in Cornwall. Um, she kept the bitch, um, who she made a champion, um, a bitch called Pixie of Wheating Prey, and we had the little brother, a dog called The Shake, and he was my first serious show dog. Um, and, I mean, he won his way into the Kennel Cup stud, and, and, you know, we, we won lots of first prizes with him at, Breed Club Championship shows when Pekingese had enormous entries. I mean, you know, you'd have two hundred plus Pekingese at all. Andrew, I don't hear you. I can hear I don't you. Hear Andrew. Hello. Yeah. Okay, now I hear you again. I think. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Something is happening. Where's Rushovitz? Wait, yes, wait one second. I think it's something with my earphones. 
Probably switched to Bluetooth here. Toy. Let let just one second. Okay, let's try now. Right. Can you hear me? Yes. Now now I hear you. Okay. Okay. Okay, so 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 we can we can continue. So where do we you have, want me to we have come to? Be? I'm not quite. I, quite I, yes, you said you said the last what I heard is when you said that you had the Pekinit who has managed to go into the stat book, and you got a lot of first prizes. So from there, more or less. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in those days. Um, uh, you know, Pekingese would, would pull more than 200 dogs at, at all the championship shows. It was a very, very competitive breed. And, um, you know, I mean, I was I was just a new kid on the block. Um, I mean, I was entering the dog at the breed club championship shows, mainly in the special beginners, you know. Um, but he won a lot of very good first prizes under a lot of very good judges. And in those days, you have to remember that... Um, Pekingese were judged mainly, probably 90% of the judges were breed specialist judges. I mean, Pekingese were never given to all around the judges in those days. Okay. So, and and then, know, it was, then I, I, I got heavily into the Pekingese. And um, by this time, I mean, the parents had just abandoned all hope you know and we had a small kennel in the garden um and i i used to buy a lot of pekingese um because we had a few very good pekingese breeders in the areas i would buy puppies groom them up train them up do a little bit of winning with them sell them you know mainly overseas and you know did very nicely at that and it was actually a pekingese that was the, was the breed where i had my very first champion okay and then how did you how did you come to beagles then oh yeah now that was interesting um i i was doing very well with uh, with the pygmies um and i was taking the pigs to the championship shows also doing the local shows and um i'd seen beagles around and they were um little mainly tricolor rather fine bone dogs with sort of snipey faces and i mean you just really didn't look at them twice and then one day i went to rogerston open show and there was a lady there called uh Rini davis and she had a six month beagle bitch puppy she was called md amy i remember that and um, yes. I took one look at this bitch and I just melted. I'd never seen anything so beautiful in all my life. She had this finish of poor face. She had bone right down to her feet. She was short. She had a crested neck. She held her tail perfectly. She just stood there. And I thought, my God, if beagles can look like that, I want a beagle. And she worked for um, a, a guy called Douglas Appleton, who was very, very controversial. Some of the old British viewers, if we have any, will have heard of him or even remember him. Um, but I mean, they, they had a very serious beagle kennel, but they also bred beagles um, and they did it openly for vivisection, for laboratories. And of course, that was mm -hmm. extremely controversial. So I you know, the Appletons it be were controversial not, also today. The, the Appletons were not everyone's favorite people, but they had imported a dog from the USA called um, Appleine Valadez Happy Fella, who was the sire of this particular bitch puppy, and. Um, I, I then researched, you know, who'd used him and, you know, da 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 da. Um, and he'd also been used by um, Marion Spavin, who sadly recently left us. Um, 
and produced Marion's, um, I mean, the most legendary stud dog, champion player in Gamble, um, was sired by this American dog. So I then found out that there were some local, local to me, the breeders, um, who had used Gamble on their champion bitch, Duffy Bonnie Girl. Um, and I, I got a, a dog puppy from that litter, um, a dog called um, Duffy Gatsby of Drag Band, who was the litter brother to champion Duffy Harris Tweed, who did a huge amount of winning. So my first beagle was a grandson of this American dog that the Appletons had imported. Um, and then I became very involved with the Bradley family who, who had the Duffersies and co-owned various dogs with them. And, and we did we did very well. Okay. So actually out of this uh, out of these three breeds, uh, boxers, pecanies and beagles, you didn't have any other breeds at home. I didn't have any other breeds. Did I have any other breeds other than those? Yes. Other well, yeah, than beagles, I mean, oh, oh. and boxers. I mean, at, at, at home, it, it was always, you know, the, the, the original boxer, then the Pekingese and then the beagles. Um, at the, okay. Be, before the beagles, I mean, I also had um, the occasional addition of, of another toy dog. I mean, I had um, a couple of Japanese chins, a couple of pugs, a couple of griffons. Um, I co-owned okay. a Great Dane. I co-owned a Pointer. Um, I mean, I you know, I had interest in lots of different breeds, but I mean, those were the breeds that they were the sort yeah. of yeah. the sort of home breeds. Yeah, main breeds, let's say. But uh, yeah. I mean, you you mentioned now. I mean, showing the dogs and uh, and of course, and, I, uh, I, I mean, I I also had a, um, I mean, in the early days, I you know, listen, listen, when I was in my late teens, I would handle anything. I mean, if anybody gave me a dog to show, I'd show it. You know, I didn't care whether it was okay. good, bad, or indifferent. I just loved being in the room, um, <clears throat> and I I was lucky because I get the opportunity to handle a few very good afghan hounds again when the breed you know we'd have we'd have 60 afghans at a little open show um and i showed a couple of, of um very successful afghans in the early days um and got to meet up with with Arnold, who was a friend of mine for more than 40 years who sadly passed away the other week um the the sire of his dog and his own dog i mean i showed you know, with, with a lot of success uh, on various occasions. Andrew also showed his own dog down again. So uh, there was the, the Afghan involvement was there sort of way back and then resurfaced years later. That's another story. Okay. But, I mean, now when you're talking, uh, you, you mentioned the breeds, you mentioned the, the, the shows and so on, but uh, you have never been breeding dogs, let's say, on a high scale. Why is that? I've, I've, I've never, I mean, I have bred dogs, obviously. I mean, I've bred yeah, I know, I know. beagles, beagles primarily. I have, I, I never had an ambition to be a large scale breeder for two reasons. Um, firstly, um, I, I hate letting puppies go. You know, yes, once, once they difficult. get, once they get to seven or eight weeks, their own, you know, they, they are individual characters. And um, I just hated selling puppies. Um, and, and I mean, on, on several occasions, people actually came to collect puppies. And the minute I met them, I thought, you know, they're not leaving with one of my, you know. And I'm not going to fall into yes, the yes. trap of referring to them as fur babies, God help us. Um, but anyhow, you know, some of them were not going to get a puppy from me. And of course, the, you know, the other, I, I literally bred a litter when I wanted something to show. That was the only reason for me to breed a litter. Okay. Okay. Uh, listen, let's try now once again to play this uh, video of Panda to see if you can hear it because uh, we have few of the videos and uh, there is no point of uh, going on with them if um, if you cannot hear them so let's try to to do it once again okay 
Let me try. Let me try the next one just in case that I want. Let's see. Can you hear me, Andrew? Can Andrew hear me? Andrew, can you hear uh, Christian? Andrew? Yeah? Can you hear Christian? No. Hello, hello, hello. Maybe that's why he cannot hear these videos. <sighs> okay, do you want to, not, was... to try to take him out and then put him back in again? Oh, you know what? I know why. Like this on Graham Norton. Okay, 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 okay. I know, I know why he might not be able to hear me, but I don't know why. Okay, let's do this. Um, Andrew, wait just one second. Let me try to solve this. I know why. Mm, focus, not focus. I'm gonna focus Andrew for this. Can you see me and hear me, Andrew? Can you Andrew, see me? Andrew? Can you hear Christian now? Hello, hello, hello. hello. Andrew, okay. Oh, can you hear Christian now? Yes, can you see me? I think now Christian he cannot hear. Can you see me? Can you see me? Hear me? Christian in the corner. The bottom? Let's try this. Let's try just in case. Uh -huh. Okay. I can see Christian in the corner. I'm not hearing anything. Okay. I don't know why. Christian, he can see you, but he cannot hear you. Okay. Let me do something. I know how. Give me one second. Okay. Andrew, wait just one second because I would really like to to solve this little problem. Okay, let's see if this works. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, can you hear me, Andrew? Andrew, do you hear Christian now? No. No. No, uh -huh. I, I don't know. Okay, so we're gonna go back to you two and because he's if he doesn't hear me, he's not gonna hear the videos, but let's put one just in case. Uh, okay. okay let's, let's I mean, what we can do in the worst case is that Christian, maybe you can send uh, you can send a video when I tell you. You can just forward it to, um, by on Messenger if Andrew has a phone near him, and then he can see it there, maybe. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Do you have? Ask him if he has his phone by. Andrew, do you have your phone near you? Okay, so if, if uh, Christian sends you a me on Messenger a video, can you play it and listen to it? Okay. Let's yeah, I could do. We're gonna we're gonna play it here also for everyone. Okay, but Christian, let's go yes. back to. Can you send Can you send Panda to to, to Andrew? To Andrew okay. By messenger? Yes. Uh, and then he will hear it, and you can you can play it once again here. Sounds good. Sounds good to me, uh, Andrew. Okay. I think the people are going to get bored now. <laughs> you don't, you no. don't need to worry about it. When they start to get bored, they have a surprise. <laughs> they have a surprise. Okay. I just send it to him. Okay. Check, check Andrew, if you got the video from uh, from Christian. We're gonna get it soon. He's gonna get it soon. He's going. It's going to him. There you go. He got can, it. Can you play? Can you, Christian, then play Panda for everybody else once again? Yep. Okay. Let me go away. Hi, everyone. Hi, there you go. Hi, Andrew. You know, if you guys ask me who is one of the most important in my life, I can immediately tell you guys he's the one and only, Mr. Andrew. Chris. Oh well, my God, dear Angel, always support me, uplift me, comfort me, and bring joy to my soul. Thank you so much, Andrew, for everything. I will not trade it for anything, never. Love you both. That was so sweet. That was so yes. Sweet. Okay. And she's so, li anyhow, listen. Listen, you know, you know, she's also a big part of my life, so it works both ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Okay, so uh, let's do it like this. Um, we, we were talking a little bit about, uh, about uh, uh, all the things. So we have one more video. Uh, Christian, if you could send, please, uh, by messenger, second video to, to Andrew and play right. here for the rest of the people the, the second video. Is that possible? Uh, am I here? Am I here like double? Because Andrew is playing it, and if I play it here, we might hear double. But let's try. Yes, send it to me by messenger and put it here for other people. Yes. Uh, okay. Let me check. I'm gonna go to the third one because I cannot find the second one. But we're gonna do this. Ah, oh, come on. It says. It says okay. I can. The 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 long ones I cannot send by messenger is max twenty five megabytes. So I can send. I'm gonna send <laughs> Carlos next. Okay. Uh, can you play it here? Yes, I will. Okay. So put the second one here, and if you can try to send to Andrew. Hi, Andrew. I could not resist sharing this moment with you today. Oh my God, it's Paula. Yes, we hear the... ...a long time, and you're a person I greatly admire. So I'm looking forward to your interview, and wish you all the best. Carla, the yeah. Marquesa, how fabulous. Yes, yeah, did you manage to hear anything from her? She is such a special lady, Carla, she really is. Yeah, I'm at the play it. You know, one of um can you hear me? Can I can you hear, hear you. Yes, I can hear you. It seems to be that you don't hear me when you put those stupid things in your ears. <laughs> yes, yes. Valentina was trying to fix it, but it's not working. But do you hear me? Well you're breaking up recently. But anyhow, okay, can, so do you hear me? Christian, if you just move the video. If you move the video, then we go back to the... Do you want me to play it here? Do you want me to play it here? No, 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 just move it. Just move it, okay. There we go. Okay, do you hear right. me well now? Yes, I, I hear you well now. Right, okay, so that, that, okay. that we've, I've just got, I just had the video message from Carla. Yes. Yes, okay. So anyhow, uh, I think I think the best is uh, Christian. If you can just, uh, we will do it in a different way because obviously this is not working for some reason. Uh, no. If you can just um, email or message or send by messenger the videos to Twitter, and, and we will yeah. look at, and we will look at all of them just at the end of everything so that we are not making this this big oh, race with trying to. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I think I I I think that's very sensible. But perfect. You know, it was interesting okay. that, that you got that message from Carla, which is very, very sweet of her. Because um, when, uh, uh, when we were making uh, the, the audiences with, with Dog World TV, um, I think one of my greatest achievements was actually the audience we did with Carla. Because yes. she is a very, very private person. Um, who has had an incredibly interesting life, which has not always been easy. And I think the way that, that we managed to get her really to sort of expose herself in the nicest possible way um, in that DVD was, I, I was, I was really proud of that. And it was interesting, yeah. you know, months, months afterwards, um, I spoke to, to Carla's daughter, Katerina, um, and Kat said to me, you know, she said, I discovered things I never knew about my mother um, yeah. that had come out in this DVD. Um, but no, Carla, is a, she's a very, very clever lady. She's someone I have a huge amount of time for. Okay. We have, we have some of your friends who sent uh, some videos, and actually, like, the plan was to play this video so during the interview, but as this is not working perfectly, um, um, Christian is going to to send them to you, the short ones by messenger and the longer ones by email. And okay. um, at the end of the interview, he is going to play them all together for the people who are here with us. 
and you will yeah, be able paper. to watch them on your phone and then we can make just a short comment on, on that once when it all is finished that we are not breaking it up all the time is that okay like with everybody run. yeah excellent okay so let's go back uh, let's go back to the questions um i read um somewhere that you showed uh, a dog for the last time at crafts in 2000 is that true say that again uh i read that you showed for the last time in your life you oh, showed yeah. your yeah, dog yeah. at crafts in 2000 yeah in 2000 i'd made the decision to retire from exhibiting because i know oh, not everyone okay so wait, wait, this. wait 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 Wait, here is the questions. So, uh, I, I have I have uh, two questions out of this. First question is, uh, was it a difficult decision to decide to stop showing dogs? Do you miss it? I mean, uh, after did you miss it for uh, after you have stopped showing? And a second question is, do you think that the top judges should continue breeding and showing dogs? Right, okay. Do I, I had made a conscious decision um, because I personally, um, and other people think differently, but you're asking my opinion. Um, exactly. I personally think that when you are judging to the extent that I was, you have to make a decision. You have to decide whether you want to be an exhibitor or a judge. Um, I know some people feel differently. They say that, you know, judges need to keep their feet on the ground. There are some people that circumvent the rules by just transferring their dogs into ridiculously fictitious ownerships so they can have them shown at the same shows they're judging. Um, that's down to them. But personally, I think you have to, you have to decide what you want to be. Um, and um, I, I had, uh, I decided that, okay, you know, I'd, I'd been very fortunate. I'd had a lot of success in the ring, um, but then was the time, you know, to sort of pack it in. And I, you know, I was on a good run with the Mikey dog and um, now I've lost Ante. I'm not here anymore for you, you don't hear me. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Okay, I don't know why, Christian will try to fix, but anyhow, uh, we can continue talking until I come back to your screen. Uh, tell me, if you hear me well, of course. Uh, you have never, I mean, once you, you stopped showing dogs, you have never lost the, the interest, obviously, for these three breeds that, that uh, you were involved in with Pekinis and the, and the Boxers and the Beatles. Uh, when you compare the quality and, and the, the, the numbers of, of dogs shown nowadays, do you think that uh, compared to when you were showing these three breeds and today that the quality has gone up or the quality has gone down well the the, the the question the question is answered extremely simply um as far as the i don't know whether you actually included boxes in that did you include boxes yes, yes, or I included just... all three breeds. right i mean you know I would never consider myself a successful boxer exhibitor, but it's still my heart breed. Um, I, th exactly. I think, in fair, I think, in fairness, that the quality um, of boxers, particularly in the UK, um, is is as high as it's ever been. Um, and we have a lot of visiting judges from other countries, and they they always compliment the British boxers on the standard that they have. And you see, if you think about it. If you think about it geographically, um, you have the American boxers that tend to be supremely elegant, stylized, sometimes a little over refined. Then you have the European dogs that are, you know, very substantial, sometimes to the degree of being over typed. Um, and in the middle of, of the map, you, you have Britain. And as far as the breed is concerned, I think we actually have a good blend of a sort of middle of the road box so we have a bit of elegance we have enough substance um and I, the, the british boxes i think are of a high quality um as far as Pe okay as far as, and what about the beagles and the as Pekinese? far as the pekingese are concerned i mean it's heartbreaking 
you do have a few dedicated breeders left, but the numbers that we have at our shows are now pathetic. Um, the standard of the dogs is nothing like it used to be. Um, you know, the, 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 the breed has changed and not for the better, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of it is down to the fact that, you know, Pekingese were a very, they were a very popular pet breed. You know, when I was a kid, lots of people had pet Pekingese. Um, but of course, when the breed went through this metamorphosis in the show ring, and it was like more hair and more hair and more hair. And you had these walking footstools. Um, that's not the kind of breed that appeals to the pet buying public. Um, and unfortunately, I think the, 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 the standard of the breed overall um, is, is nothing like as, as high as it was when I was showing them. Having said that, um, there are still some extremely clever, extremely successful breeders who are producing beautiful Pekingese that could win anywhere and at any time, but they're in the minority. The Beagles, okay. um, I think, I think the Beagles, we have a very, very um, strong breed. Uh, I think the, the breed in the UK certainly is at a very high level. Um, it's, it's very unusual to judge Beagles at a championship show and not have, you know, five or six dogs that you would happily give a CC to. Okay, so generally speaking, you think that Pekin is more or less can go in the worst direction? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, pigs are in a mess. Yes. Okay. Well, now when we are on Pekinis, um, uh, I'm going to mention one name, which I know has always been extremely important for you. And um, I know how many times you have mentioned this person. And I want to, to explain a little bit uh, why he was so important for you. And, uh, and um, in general, you, you must be talking, you, 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 must be, you, must be, you must be talking about Nigel. Exactly. Exactly. I wanted to, to ask you a question uh, because you mentioned him so, so often. Um, why, why is it so important sometimes in your life to have somebody like you had uh, Nigel to mentor you and to advise you and to help you and to support you? Um, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I think anyone um, who has been successful in this, in this world um has done so or been so um because of a combination of things um firstly you have to have passion and it's it's not just a passing interest it's passion it's that thing that you know is your lifeblood you have to have someone who takes an interest in you who is prepared to channel that passion and give you help and give you guidance. And as far as Nigel is concerned, I mean, for those that don't know, Nigel Aubrey Jones was like myself, a Welshman, um, but he had actually um, emigrated to Canada before we really became friendly. Um, he was a, a, a Pekingese breeder, as was his father before him. And Nigel was one of those incredible guys um, who had a phenomenal eye for a dog. And he, he, made, he made a lot of serious money buying dogs in the UK and, and selling them to, to fanciers in Canada and, and the USA. Nigel um, saw something in me um, and, and, and nurtured it. Having said that, he was also my biggest critic. I mean, if, if I had done something or said something or written something that he thought was stupid or um, unwise, he was the first to tell me. Um, but he was the first to give me credit when he thought it was due. And um, he was not only 
a, a, a sort of guiding light as far as my doggy career was concerned. Um, he was a, if you, he was a life coach, if you like. I mean, Nigel had lived. Nigel had really lived. And he and his partner, Bill, you know, were two of my dearest friends. I mean, they were both hugely respected as, as breeders and judges. Nigel, as a writer, I mean, he was the most brilliant writer. Um, I mean, it, you know, I often read his articles, note, you know, to this day, the articles he wrote in Dog News and various other publications. Um, and he was, he was a, he was a genius. And, and when I did, you know, when I started doing judging seminars many, many years down the road, I found myself quoting Nigel so often because a lot of what I was passing on wasn't, you know, it wasn't original thinking on my part. It was quoting this guy who was, was just um, someone who, he, he was a, a mentor, an idol, whatever. And, um, okay. you know, there's not, a, there's, there's not a day goes away when, in some context, I don't think of that sure. Okay. And tell me, I mean, now when we are, when we are talking about mentoring and, and all this, um, do you think that there are still, uh, first of all, do you think that there are still people like him, um, experienced breeders or judges, who are ready to share their time and knowledge with the young generations? And do you think that the young generations are interested in that? That's a very interesting question, actually. And if I'd had the opportunity to have any input in these questions, I'd probably have given you that one. So well done. Okay. You're doing good. Um, okay. You see? When, when um, Nigel always used to say to me that we were so lucky that we came in on the tail end of the golden years. Because we did. I mean, you know, I, I mean, he was in it years before me, but I mean, I came in, I just saw the end of the glory days. Um, in the UK, I was very fortunate because we still had a lot of big kennels. We had large scale kennels with, with breeders <clears throat> who kept, you know, mainly one breed, sometimes a couple of breeds. But you could go to these big kennels and see dogs in numbers. You could, you could see um, a variety of ages, um, dogs that were generally sort of other type. Um, and it was visiting these kennels was a fantastic way of, of learning and getting your eye in. And, and you, had, you had breeders that were prepared if you showed the interest they they would they would give you everything i mean you know m many many hours i spent at um sandy lungs uh, with gwen broadley and gwen was gwen was the most marvelous person um she was probably the most modest person i'd ever met she'd had a very, very colorful life that was tinged with tragedy on various levels. But she she bred dogs, primarily Labradors. I mean, Sandilands Labradors set a benchmark for quality around the world. Um, and if Gwen sensed an enthusiasm in someone, she would just share, you know? And um, I mean, although Gwen has passed on the kennel continues thankfully in the hands of erica jays who went to work for gwen when she was you know still in the gym slip i mean she was a kid um and i mean erica has continued you know the same principles that gwen had and and continues to produce the same level of quality you know the the sandy lens labradors are still marvelous um Yes. So, as you said, we had kennels. I mean, you had Sandy Lens, you had the Loch Ranza kennel, you know, with Cocker Spaniel and a few, few other breeds. That Shih Tzu's bred a couple of really good pugs. Um, Raymond Oppenheimer's um, Ormondy Bull Terrier kennel, you could go to and see numbers. And now I've lost you off camera. Are you still there? 
Yes, yes, I'm listening to you. Okay, I don't, I don't see you, but um, I, I right. see you perfectly. Okay, okay let's okay. finish this question and then we try to ask Christian to take you out and take him just for one second so that we try that you see me back. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So to finish to finish the question. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, you, we don't have the, the numbers of, of those big camels. Probably, probably one of the last was Judy Avery's said and terrier kennel, where you could go and, and see, you know, numerous breeds, um, and you know, many dogs, all all of a very high quality. And um, again, Judy was someone that would share her knowledge. I mean, you and Pierre came to visit the camel with me some years ago. Yes, exactly. Yes. yes. Um, but as, okay. As, as Christian, far... can you try maybe to say? Ah, okay. You didn't finish. Tell me. No, I had. I hadn't finished. Can I continue? Yes, yes I'm listening. Yeah. Okay. I think you know. You asked, are there are, are, are the young people still around? Do they still want that mentorship? Yes, and um, if there I, are still old people who want to share the knowledge. Well, we, we yes, we do. We still do have excellent breeders, you know, at, around the world um, that 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 have a lot of knowledge to share. But I think, unfortunately, these days, I don't see, um, and you know, it's dangerous to generalize because obviously there are exceptions. But generally speaking, I don't see the numbers of people wanting to go to those people and, and ask them to share the knowledge. It was interesting, I, I, one of the audiences that I did, we had in the audience um, several big breeders, um, Marion Spaven, Ken Sinclair, Mike Gadsby, Patsy Hollings, and um, I posed the question to them, how often did people contact them, young up and coming people, and ask if they could come to the kennel and just kind of study the breed? None of them could remember anyone actually asking them that. And I, I, yeah. I, thought, yeah. I, I thought that was very, very, I thought that was very, very sad. And you see, the yeah, I, 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 this is the this is why I have asked you this question because I feel exactly the same like you do that there are still people who want to share their knowledge, but that there are no people who want to get that knowledge. I think this is the biggest well, unfo problem. <coughs> Unf unfortunately, you know, we live in a society where everything is instant, and I mean, I I found with past experience. Um, people, people will come to you and you'll do your best to help them. And then you find six months down the road, they're actually telling you. So, yes, you yes, know, that then, then, yes. then, then you, tend, then you tend to lose patience or at least I lose patience. And you see, yeah, I, I can we, 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 were, we were talking earlier, you know, about mentors and whatever, and the Nigels of this world. I was very lucky because again thanks to people helping me um i got i got to judge overseas when i was relatively young and i started going to scandinavia a lot and the the, the person who, who got me to scandinavia originally was joe Braden, um who wasn't someone i was desperately close to but um anyhow i began going to scandinavia and then every time i went to scandinavia we would we go to the big ring and we would and I, I mean they thought i was like a bit of a freak because i was kind of a child as far as british judges were concerned these days you know i'm the oldest on the panel but hey times change yes <laughs> but you go to the you go to the groups and you would fight to sit next to the likes of um ulla segerstrom uh, Marianne Fuss Danielson, Hasse Lechtinen, these giants, and you would just sit as close to them as possible and listen to them as the dogs came into the groups. 
and they would discuss the dogs, the breed type, breed characteristics. They would answer questions. And, you know, I mean, I felt I was like a sponge because, you know, you could just get so much out of these people. Um, I mean, these days, you know, I noticed the last few years when I was just regularly, you'd go to the group ring and the sort of new generation of judges, they weren't there seeking advice from the judges at the group ring. You know, all they could talk about is where they judged last week, where they're judging next week, who uses the best hotels, who gives the best hospitality, and how soon can we get back to the hotel bar? I mean, the whole profile yes. has yeah. changed, and I, I find that terribly depressing. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can understand it. Okay, uh, Christian, do you think uh, it's too risky to try to take Andrew out and back in again so that he see all, also me um, or not? Um, let me see. When you're making that decision, I'm going to have a little comfort break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I guess that explains it. I guess it's a yes. Yes, no, yes. Okay, oh. try try. Yes, try to... well, I'll, I'll take him out and I'll add him for, for when he comes back. Okay. You managed okay. to send him the videos? No, they're too big. They're too big, so, so we cannot send it. Let me now find yeah, them. Jovana, Jovana, can, Jovana can just uh, email him the B transfers files so he can maybe download Yeah, them. He'll, he'll, he'll see them. He'll get them. Uh, okay, I'm going to invite him again. So when he comes back from his break. Yes, yes. He can... Okay, while we are doing this, while we are doing this, maybe I would like also to connect again to my earphones. But I don't know how to do that. Oh, Andrew's coming back. Okay, then, then leave it. <clears throat> Let's hope he's... I know his, his Wi-Fi is not perfect, so that's why maybe um, he's having little problems. But we yes, can maybe, well. maybe now when he is back, maybe you can try once again to play this short video. Yeah, if, he, can, if he can hear me. If he can hear me, then he should be able to see these videos. Okay. 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 Uh, where is? Hold on. Let me is text him on. No, but let me text him. I know he had a little problem before, but uh, uh, what's looking? Yeah, his his internet is not great, but he'll. I just took him off once and then put him back on. So let me give me a minute. Okay. Yeah, because I think it's much easier if he can also see me because I have finished last interview watching only to myself and it's not a lot of fun. And I, I don't know, uh, Christian, if people are writing something or not in the comments. No, because I cannot see any comments or anything being written. Last right. So far. That's, that's Valentina's job. <laughs> ah, here's Last back. There we go. Could, uh, Here we go. You're back in. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. Can, can you hear me? Why, why don't you, you hear just... Christian? No. Can you hear me now? Why, okay. why don't you just stick to what you're doing and leave it until yes. the end? Because this is... yes, no, no, no. We were just uh, checking if you can hear us. Okay, so you hear me. Yeah, I hear you. You can hear me perfectly. perfectly. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's go on. Okay, now this is a, a little bit, uh, a little bit tough question. It's not going to be easy for you to answer it. Uh, but maybe maybe you will manage. If I would ask you uh, uh, during your career and 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 um, and as a judge and as a dog person in general, to say one name, one breeder, who you think that has managed during all these years to continue breeding top quality dogs, uh, which name would you say? You're talking about just one breeder. Yes, I, I want that you say just one name. 
Guy Spagnolo. Guy Spagnolo. Okay. And if I would ask you to say one name, one judge who is not alive anymore, who is not with us anymore, who has made the greatest impact on you, uh, who would it be? Alice Hume. Okay. And then the third question, if you would need to say one judge which is still alive and still judging, who would it be? Anne Ingram. Wonderful. Okay. That, that was easier than what I thought. Okay. Let's, let's go to the next question. Um, you were approved as the best in show judge, I read, in 1988. Is that true? Yeah, at, at the time I was the youngest best in show judge. Yeah, sure. Okay. Do you have any idea, more or less, how many best in shows did you judge in your life? Yes, 17. In the UK. Okay, yeah, but altogether much more obvious. Oh, right? I have no idea. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't begin okay. to guess. So, okay, so listen, I have, I have one question that I don't think that many people would, uh, would dare to ask. Um, and I'm not even sure that this bothers you, but it bothers me a little bit. So I'm going to ask it. Uh, I mean, everybody knows that uh, you have been one of the most traveled, most experienced, most knowledgeable judges from the UK. I think there are no discussions about that. How come that you have never, ever in your life judged one group at Crafts, not even to mention Best in Show, which I think you should have judged many years ago, but do you know for my piece to give me the answer on the question? Why? Well, I think that question you need to direct to the Crafts Committee. I can't answer it. Okay. You, you don't know the answer to it. Okay. I, so I, I don't I think they would answer I wish to... I'd... Listen, it doesn't bother me anymore. I've judged 13 breeds. I know. I know. Okay. Yeah, I know. It, I, I was thinking, I mean, I know it doesn't bother you, but it bothers me a little bit. Because I, I think that many people who are listening and watching this um will will think that that in that way they have not been very fair to you but uh, as you said this is not n not um, something that uh, you should know the answer maybe they know the answer yeah um, maybe they do. talking now let's say about yeah talking now um about about uh, let's say the the canon club and everything um after the the bbc documentary pedigree dogs exposed has been released uh, do you think that uh, the Kennel Club and in general the the the, doc, the purebred dog society had reacted well on that on that documentary? The dogs. Well, I, I didn't get the last bit of the question. After after that, the documentary. Do you think that? Yeah. What was the yes, question? Yes. Do you after? think that? Do you think that the Kennel Club and in general the the purebred dog society have reacted well after the, the, the documentary has been released? No. Um, and what would you do? Well, basically, um, you know, one of, one of the biggest problems that we have at this point in time is the fact that the whole concept of purebred dog breeding and, and, and um, confirmation competition is the subject of huge criticism from the animal rights people and this is a this is a lobby that has a lot of power and a lot of money behind it and they infiltrate um on so many levels including the veterinary profession i'm afraid and these these people get inside the heads of these activists and suddenly purebred dogs become everything that is bad. Now, following that television program, I would have expected to see the, the, the relative, the, 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 the body's concern to come out fighting on behalf of the breeders. And instead they just rolled over and played dead. 
and they, they just fueled the, the, the criticism of the people who were making readers' lives hell. And I, you know, I, yes. I, I, I think that it, I think probably the American Kennel Club actually did more on behalf of its readers than anywhere else in the world. Um, but but yes. generally speaking, I mean, you know, the, the, the reaction to that after following that program, you know, with those ridiculous vets tests and everything, um, I, I, I just felt it was it was it was tackling the problem from entirely the wrong angle. But what they needed to do was to say, hey, you know, this is the, the, the positive side of pedigree dogs. And not just say, oh, yeah, well, maybe you've got a point, so perhaps we should make it tougher for the breeders. And I'm sure there yes. are a lot of people yeah, who I agree, agree I, with me. I, I, I agree. I agree with that, um, what, what you said. And I mean, um, you being so passionate about the sport and, and about judging and, and pedigree dogs, um, what do you think at this point is the future of the sport in general? I worry about it desperately. Um, I think, and, and I'll be perfectly honest, I, I wouldn't really want to be breeding dogs at the moment because not only have you got the, you've got the animal rights lobby, you know, fighting very aggressively, but as far as the breeder is concerned, I'm talking about the genuine small hobby breeder. There is so much red tape now, you know, when you've got sort of, you know, all the various health tests. And don't get me wrong, I'm fully in favor of, you know, making our dogs as healthy as possible. But there is so much red tape Obviously. with lo local authority licensing. And, you know, the dogs have got to do this, the dogs have got to do that. You can't breed a litter, a litter unless you've got a separate kitchen and 16 hot water taps or whatever the hell the nonsense is. I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult to breed dogs the old fashioned way. And you see, yes. we have, you know, the, I mean, I've, I've got a, th a theory about a lot of the health issues that we, we encounter um, in, in purebred dogs. I, I grew up at a time when breeders in general had something of a stockman attitude. I mean, I can remember people, you know, dogs and bitches bred naturally bitches whelped in kennels on straw and in the morning the breeder got up and there were puppies there now if a bitch rejected a puppy there was a very good reason generally for her to do so and those puppies faded away they just died naturally and it was it was very much a question of the survival of the fittest now these days, you know, the profile of the breeder has changed. They're not all stockmen. A lot of them are pet owners who have decided that they want one litter from the bitch that they bought because that's going to pay for the next holiday or a new car or whatever. And when they have a bitch who has a sickly puppy, instead of just letting it fade away naturally, encouraged by their vet it gets tube fed and pumped full of additives and kept alive um at, at all costs despite the fact that it was so sickly that its mother wanted it to die and that that puppy will grow up and it will be sold to help finance whatever and its new owner will decide that it needs to be bred from and then it gets into the gene pool and I'm convinced that, you know, a lot of the health issues that we have are down to the fact that dogs are reared and bred from that in a previous generation wouldn't have been. Controversial. Yeah. yeah. Yes, what, yeah, what it I is feel. a bit controversial. Yeah, it is controversial, but definitely it is very interesting point. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's let's move to to another subject, um, and uh, I know how how this has been, uh, let's say, uh, important for you and difficult for you. So I will I will let you answer the question um, however you want. 
um, it's uh, it's about the, the the dog world newspaper. Yeah. Um, I know how much it meant for you. I know you had a column there. I know you have done these uh, audiences that you have mentioned before. Um, I mean, the whole newspaper thing and and everything about it has just stopped in one day. And nobody yeah. of you knew that it would stop in one day. Um, no. How did you feel about that at the, at the moment when it happened? And how do you feel about that now? Um, I'll try to answer it as briefly as possible um, without, without going into too much de detail. Um, we, we didn't know what was going on. Um, it was complete shock when we realized that things were as bad as they were. Um, and the only way that I can describe it, I mean, the loss of the paper um, and probably the likes of Simon Parsons in particular um, and Adrian Marrett, um, you, you know, felt it equally. T to me, it wasn't just a major part of the, the, the whole dog sport had disappeared. Because I mean, it was part of it was part of our part of our world. I mean, it was it, it was a major part of the dog world, not just the name, the dog world. Yes. Um, yes. I can I can best describe it like um, a bereavement, and I am, as you know, I am not a person who gets depressed. But when dog world disappeared, I went through as depressed times as I can remember. Um, and it's not something yes. I, it's not something I try to dwell on now because it still upsets me. So can we draw a veil under yeah. that? Yes, yes, yes. This is why. But I mean, I, I think it was important that you that you say something about that. Yeah. Um, sure. Let's go. Let's go a little bit, a little bit back to to judging. Um, yeah. I mean, you have traveled all around the world, and I know how important part of your life that has been. I mean, actually, that has been the only thing that you have been doing because we're just packing and unpacking and going from one country to to another and at some point of of your life and um, um i was i was one of the lucky lucky close friends who found it out uh, before everybody else you decided to stay home and to take care of uh, take care of your mother and and just to stop not to stop but let's say to pause your judging it's it's uh, a sabbat it's a sabbatical we... yeah uh, how much do you miss it? I mean, traveling, discovering beautiful dogs, meeting your friends, how much do you miss it? Okay, um, for the first month, I missed it terribly because it was a, it was like a culture shock. Um, and then you sit back and you adapt your lifestyle, you get into a different routine. Um, I do not miss um, delayed flights, lost luggage. Um, I do not miss being at dog shows, having to listen to total bullshit. I do not miss the politics and the game playing that goes on with the modern exhibitors to an alarming degree. What I do miss terribly is that thrill you get when something walks in the ring, um, possibly a youngster, maybe with an exhibitor you've never seen before, something that is totally new, that instantly makes the hairs on your back stand on end. That's what I miss. Because for me, judging dogs wasn't just going through the motions and getting to the end of the day. I, wa I, wanted, I wanted to find something. I mean, I wanted there to be that dog there okay. that excited me yeah. and thrilled okay. me, that wanted me to go back and tell my friends, oh my God, you can't believe what I saw this morning. And, and you know... Yes, I mean, the, 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 next question, the next question is, uh, is connected a little bit to what you started to say now. And, um, um, you know, nowadays, let's say, there are a lot of these judges who uh, travel around and uh, the, the, the biggest thrill that they can have is to, to have a superstar in the ring 
and you know make make it win. But in your case, uh, many times uh, you would put a, a puppy, a junior dog, or a, a top star. Um, is that what you are talking about? Finding something new, something exciting. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> the the the. The job description is putting up the best dog on the day, okay? The yes. thrill of it is when, that, when the top dog, in your opinion, happens to be something new, unheard of, undiscovered. If it's a puppy, okay, I mean, you know, I was constantly getting people taking the mickey out of me. Oh, it's braced with one of his puppies again, da, 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 da. If, if, if that puppy, is the best on the day and it, maybe it's not totally ready but those super dogs those golden dogs even as puppies if ju just for a fleeting second you know they will stand there something will take their eye they pull themselves together and all of a sudden they will give you that vision of what is to come that'll do for me you know i mean i remember when i interviewed ann rogers clark um, who was someone I got to know very well in sort of latter years. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm constantly being accused for discovering dogs before they're ready to be discovered. And I totally got that. I mean, I just understood it completely because I was probably guilty, if that's the right word, of doing it myself. But I mean, when you get a youngster that comes in the ring, um, it's, it's not a robot. It's not being trained into submission. It's a little bit naughty. It's kind of, you know, fighting the lead a little bit, maybe. It's showing a bit of personality and character. And it's just got so much quality about it. I mean, that, you know, those moments you just can't sort of replicate. And okay, sometimes, yeah. sometimes you have them in your entry. But there again, sometimes the dog that stands out is a dog that has a mighty winning record um, and deserves to win again. And, you know, no way should you even think about robbing that dog unless there is a dog that deserves to beat it. I mean, we've all seen, you know, yeah. big winning dogs winning just automatically, even when there's something better down in the classes. But, you know... Yes. There, there, there is, I think, any, any judge who is as passionate about it as I am, I think they will agree that there is something very, very special about seeing a puppy or a junior walk in the ring and you just send it round once and you never want that to stop. You send them round and you yes. think, my God, I could just watch this for hours. And, and they thrill yeah. you. And it's a, it's, it, it's, it, it is, it's, a, it's a passion, you know. Yeah. Okay. No, you have mentioned no, me. Uh, you know, when when I, when I did my when I did my judging seminars, one of the first questions that I used to ask the ask the audience just to kind of relax them a little bit was, "Why do you want to judge dogs?" And it it was very interesting the answers I used to get back, um, and a lot of them were yeah. very sort of you know, um, well, we like to put something back. We like to learn about the breeds. It's part of our education. You know, none of them ever actually said, well, I think it's a great way of seeing the world that somebody else expects. I never got that one back. Um, but I mean, I used to say to them, you know, that for me, the, the whole point of it was being able to meet those exceptional dogs at whatever age of development and seeing them in the ring you know they've they've come you know for your opinion and and they're there and they are just so thrilling such ex outstanding examples of their breed and when you send them around the ring, i mean i used to say to these people in the seminars when you send them around the ring savor the moment because it's better than sex and it lasts a lot longer Okay, that's that's also a little bit controversial, but okay. Uh, listen, you have you have mentioned it in the in the in the previous uh, previous answer, but um, I want I want to ask you that um, there are so many, especially nowadays. I don't know, maybe it has been also the same in the past. There are so many of these stories of the connections between judges and 
some handlers or breeders or show organizers or whatever. Um, I mean, obviously, once you, when you become a, a famous as a judge, you get to know almost all the famous people uh, from the dog world. And I mean, with some of them, obviously, you become good friends. Uh, my question is, how difficult is to judge a dog shown by a person you consider a friend? And is there really so much politics in judging nowadays? Um, it's, it's very, very simply answered. I mean, there is, there is no difficulty in judging dogs owned by friends or enemies. If you judge dogs, and I mean, my, my close friends know that if they show a dog to me, they won't get any special favoritism. But at the same time, and this is very, very important because I see it happen a lot and I had it done a lot to me. I would not deliberately put a friend's dog down to prove how honest I was. Um, because robbing, yes. robbing a great dog is a lot worse than rewarding a bad dog. And that might sound a bit stupid exactly. and contradictory, but it's not. No, you I, have to think about it. I can understand. And, and the, the, thing, the thing is, Ante, you know, you've been in the sport long enough. You know what I'm talking about. Whenever any dog wins something major under any judge, sooner or later, you know, it might, it might take them a little bit of time, but somebody will come up with the reason why. And I mean, exactly. you know, I always heard, ah, yeah, well, of course, you know, he put this up because, you know, he's invited him to judge there. He's put this up because, ah, well, she put it up next week or she's judging it. So all these excuses, all these ridiculous excuses, I never, ever heard anyone say at a dog show, well, he actually put that up because he thought it was the best dog in the ring. I've never heard that. One. Yeah, I agree. Which, which is yes, strange. I agree. With I that. mean, you, you asked yes. me, are there more politics? Um, and yes, I think there are. And, and, and it's probably on a slightly different level. I think that, you know, the, 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 the sort of kind of politics that go on has, has sort of changed slightly. Yes. But I mean, if, okay. you know, uh, if I, I, I have never, ever had any problem with friends showing dogs under me, provided they can take my decision. I mean, I've had exactly. so-called friends fall out with me because they haven't won. And my attitude was, well, if the friendship was that fragile, then it really wasn't worth having. Yeah, I agree on that. Okay, T tell me, tell me another thing. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe you will remember a specific case. Um, have you ever gone out of the ring? Doesn't matter a breed ring or a group ring or the best in show ring. Have you ever gone out of the ring and said to yourself, like, okay, Andrew, you fucked up this? Did it ever happen to you? Yeah. Yeah. And what what kind of feeling is it? It's horrible. It's the I mean, why feeling. why does it happen? I'll tell you why it happens. I think it sometimes you get in there and, and it can happen if if you have two dogs that are fairly close and you can you can overthink things. Now I've always been the kind of person that, that I judge very much on instinct and instant impression. And you know I get criticized a lot because I don't overhandle dogs. You know, I don't spend ages massaging them all to death you know i like to get the basic hands on and see the things move and see how they carry themselves i think sometimes you can have two dogs you know that, that are fairly close in, in and maybe have sort of different different virtues and once you start over analyzing things you can sometimes talk yourself out of a dog and um, I mean, there was there was one particular occasion. And I'm not going to mention the breed, and I'm not going to mention the dog, so don't push me on it. But I I okay. had a dog that that my my gut feeling was telling me deserved a CC, 
and I got it up against another dog that was that was <clears throat> an equally outstanding dog, but it slightly differently. And because the dog that I my my gut was telling me, it had one very obvious, rather sort of cosmetic fault. And I I just I talked myself out of it. And the minute I sent them around the ring with the CC and the reserve CC, I thought, you fucked up. Why the hell? And you know, oh. at that moment, I could feel Nigel on my shoulder saying, What were you fucking about for? Which he would have done, you yeah. know. You know that was yeah. the best yeah. job. So in a word, yeah. yes, of course we have. And anyone who says they haven't is lying. Good. Um, next thing. Um, I don't know if this will be an easy question or a tough question for you. Uh, when people ask you, what is your favorite way to judge? What, what do you answer? Um, it is a tough question because there are certain sort of like hard breeds, you know. I mean, I, I, I think it would probably have to say, rather than going all around the houses, I mean, I have a little short list of breeds that I love, but probably box. It would have to be boxers. I just love judging boxers. Okay. And, uh, and 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 if I would ask you, uh, which breed did you find the most difficult to judge? What do you would you say? Whippets. Whippets. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can nutshell. understand that. I mean, even if I, I mean, I had a whippet at home, and I always thought that was a very very difficult breed to understand, even if you see everything on them. But I think I, they are I, very, very. I, I've heard, I've heard so many people over the years say, "Oh, you know, whippets. There's no coats. They're the easiest thing in the world." I never got it. I, I mean, I, I judged whippets. Yes. I put up some beautiful whippets that have appealed to my eye. I think it's, I think it's the most difficult breed to judge. And, I mean. That might sound stupid because it's a much more generic animal than something like a bulldog. And I mean, bulldogs are, yes. of course, difficult because it's such a complex breed. Yes. But I mean, I just find whippets are not easy because of the variation in type. Yeah. When, when, when now, now you have mentioned bulldogs, um, I, I remember you told me um uh, once when i mean when when the kennel club has uh, has announced this list of uh, vulnerable breeds that would need to pass the vet check uh, after the breed judging and before going to the, you said you don't want to judge these breeds anymore in the uk why was no, that and, and i didn't and why well because i i believe why? That why? The, i believe that the judge's decision is final and I was not prepared to go in there and declare a best of breed and have some vet decide whether or not my best of breed winner was fit to go in the group. So I withdrew from those yeah. appointments. I'm sorry, but you know, is the vet judging or is the judge judging? Exactly. Okay. Um, when 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 you talk when you talk to the to the young generations and when you talk to to other people, um, you you very often you mention two things uh, the the first thing is the 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 importance of the pedigree and the second thing is uh, the importance of giving the written critiques to the dogs when you judge why do you think these two things are very important i think critiques are important um because I, I, particularly if we're doing them you know like scandinavian style um, I think the critique is, it gives you the opportunity to show how much you know about that breed by describing that dog in the context of the breed standard. And you're doing it with the dog in front of you before you've had time to look at the catalogue to see how it's bred or what it's won or who owns it or whatever. So I think, I think the written critique is valuable to the judge and it's also valuable to the exhibitor. Um, ped pedigrees, are, are, that's an entirely different matter because the, the pedigree doesn't come yeah. into the judging equation. No, no, no. I wanted, I wanted to ask you in a way, do you think that, uh, that nowadays a lot of breeders uh, just go 
to mate their bitches with the dogs which are champions without even looking at their pedigrees? Um, and do you think that new breeders uh, are really looking seriously into the pedigrees and the lines that are inside of the pedigrees like the breeders before were doing it, I think, much more serious? <clears throat> well, I, I think we still have, we still have a, a few dedicated breeders who are prepared to do it, you know, the old-fashioned way. Um, I think, generally speaking, more breeders, uh, you know, the, the, the small breeders who are breeding for the holiday or the next car, um, they will rush off and use, you know, the big winning champion regardless of how compatible the pedigrees are. Um, instead of actually studying a pedigree. And I mean, a, a, a pedigree is, in, is incredibly important because, um, you know, a pedigree will tell you so much about your own dog. And if, if you're not in a position to be able to recall the dog in that pedigree, then you should make it your business to seek out people who will have known them in the flesh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Incidentally, uh, 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 I don't see your picture. Again? No. You lost me again. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Let's do. Let's do two questions uh, uh, more like that, and then uh, for the last question, maybe we can we can uh, take you out and back again so you can see me. Um, what I wanted to ask you. Um, when all this corona thing I see you, started, I see you, you know, I see you. Perfect. Okay, when all this uh, corona, coronavirus thing uh, started, uh, people started to organize these online or let's say virtual dog shows. And yeah. I mean, you judged few of them, and I, I, I know you have judged the, the one in Australia, and you provided the 800 critiques, and you judged best yeah. in show and you yeah. have given the explanation about everything. And I mean, these online dog shows or virtual dog shows, however you want to, to call them, they have caused so much of controversy among I can't, judges. I, 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 cost... cannot, I cannot believe the reaction of people. And yes. to be perfectly honest... Let, let, me, let, me, let me just finish, finish the question. I okay. mean, they, it, first of all, they have caused so much controversy I mean, not only this, it has uh, created so much of a hate speech among the dog people. And I mean, yeah. connected to them, if you give me a short answer about your point on it, do you think that we, dog people, are really, at the end of the day, our own worst enemies? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, th these, animal, these animal rights people, eater and whatever, they don't actually need to lift a finger because if they just sit back and watch the dog people, they will slowly devour themselves. Because the infighting and, and the viciousness that you see, particularly on Facebook, um, is so, so depressing. But I mean, to go back to, to the, the, the trigger of your question, which was these virtual online photographic competitions, I could not believe some of the bullshit that I was reading online from these so-called judges who felt that it was beneath their position or beneath their status to actually commit an opinion based on a photograph. Now, have they, have they ever actually been to a judging seminar? Have they actually been to some kind of educational facility where they are looking at photographs? But, I mean, the, the pomposity of it was staggering. And, I mean, when I, I mean, I, I did, you know, I had a small input with the one that you were involved with in Croatia, which was fine. Um, then when John Bryson asked me to do this one in Australia, um, I have to say, at the time I accepted, there was no hint that it might end up with 800 dogs and 800 critiques. Um, and I mean, I worked on that for 20 days, but um, I mean, apart from the fact that um, f from the feedback that John has given me, it seemed to be sort of well received. 
Um, and of course, they, they had the opportunity of feeding in dogs. You know, a lot of the dogs I was putting up, you know, had been dead for years. And so there was no, you know, they didn't have to be live dogs, which gave it another dimension. But I mean, what I found on a personal level, bearing in mind that I haven't actively been judging for, for three years, um, I thought it was extremely challenging for me because um, in some of the, and I mean, I judged these classes just like a normal dog show. I mean, I looked at all the photographs collectively so that you could see like the overall status of the breed um, before you got into doing the individual critiques. And I mean, in some of the breeds that I wasn't judging on a regular basis, yes, I had a sort of refreshing read through the breed standard before I started. So, you know, although it was damned hard work, I mean, I found it very rewarding for me. And, and the other thing that it did for me <clears throat> was it, it reinforced, not that I ever did really have any doubts, but it reminded me that I still have that passion for seeing fabulous dogs, or in this instance, yes. fabulous pictures. Because some of those photographs yeah. just thrilled me. And I mean, the, 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 the Cocker Spaniel who went best in show, there is a, a moving shot um, taken by Barbara Kilworth. Um, and I mean, I can still see it in my head now of this Cocker Spaniel just holding itself and opening up so perfectly. So um, yeah. I, I, I just found it nauseating how pompous and arrogant some of these people were about the very concept of these online competitions, yeah. which at the end of the, end of the day <laughs> were only being done to stimulate and maintain people's interest in our sport. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tell me now you were, I mean, you, you were talking now about this, uh, uh, giving you back this, uh, this uh, passion and, uh, to 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 see a beautiful dog um if i would ask you uh, during all the years while you were judging um which would be one dog that you will never ever forget in your life which one would it be it's a very very unfair question i know because, it is but because because there are so many um i mean there's a, there's a kind of a you know, there's kind of a short list. I mean, I, I can remember, I mean, the, the very first general championship show I went to as a kid, um, <clears throat> knowing nothing about any dogs and a, a tiny little bit about boxers. I remember staying and watching Best in Show and, and there was a, a, a standard wirehead dachshund who went Best in Show, shown by a lady called Betty Farrand and the dog's name was Gisborne Inca. Um, and I remember him winning Best in Show and seeing him stand. She didn't touch this dog. He just stood there and, and just did it himself. Um, he was, he was that, a dog that made me perhaps have a grasp of what a great dog was. And I mean, over the years, you know, there have been dogs that... Um, I've seen but never judged. There have been dogs that I have judged um, that, that slot into that sort of greatness category. So, I mean, are, are, you, are you putting me in a corner again and wanting what? Well, well I, would, I would like that you tell me one dog that you have judged that you will never forget. Well, th there are dozens that I'll never forget, Ante. I know, but I want one. <laughs> <clears throat> the, okay, well, the one, I think the one that probably had the most impact on me was, yeah, yeah, it would have to, it would have to be her. In, in 2000, I think it was 2010, um, I had a, a, a fantastic assignment at Westminster, and one of the breeds was, was standard poodles. And I got down to a, a, a dog and a bitch for the breed, 
And this black bitch, who, and, and at the time, I had no idea who the bitch was, who the handler was. The male, I didn't know who the dog was, but the handler was Simon Briggs, the um, Australian guy who I've known since he was like that high. I remember him coming to Crufts as a junior handler. Um, and I think he actually won overall under Rick Beauchamp. Anyhow, he was handling a male. Um, and then this young lady was handling the bitch. And I'd, I'd sent them round, and I just got the two of them in the middle of the ring and said to the two handlers, would you just turn the dogs to face me? And at this juncture, my dear friend Nicholas Canales from Greece was ringside explaining to all the population around the ringside what was going to happen next. Um, and anyhow, I just had the dog and the bitch look towards me. Um, and at that point, Nicholas said to everyone who was listening, he's about to make the bitch best of breed. And that's exactly what I did. And that yes. bitch was that bitch was called um, uh, Darwin Spitfire. The the lady who was handling was called Sarah Regal. I think she's now married and has a different name. And I think the male that Simon was handling was called Scaramouche, classic Scaramouche. I may have that wrong. But anyhow, this Darwin Spitfire um, was, from the minute she came in the ring, I, I was mesmerized. And, you know, very, very, very occasionally, dogs put on a performance where they just don't put a foot wrong. And, you know, when you're judging, you all, when there's something that excites you, you know, you've always got, like, one corner of your eye just checking if it's doing anything wrong. And every time I glanced at this bitch, she was just perfect. And of course, when we did this free stack in the middle of the ring, turn them and face me, please. This bitch, I mean, she just stood there and you know how standard poodles can do it now and again. She kind of arched her neck and looked down her nose at me as if I was just a piece of shit she'd trodden it basically it was that yeah. sort of you know yeah. who do you think you are and oh god i mean yeah okay and, I mean, okay so we have sorted out also we have sorted out also that dogs, question but, i mean she she has yeah such, and, and for, for, there's a there's a sequel to that story um she was the, that was the last breed i judged on, on the day so i then made my way to lunch and as i was going past um, I walked past Frank Sabella's ring where he was judging Afghan hounds. And um, we haven't even mentioned Sabella, you see. I thought you were going to start yes. going down that track earlier on. Anyhow, um, yeah. Frank was in the middle of going over some Afghan hounds and he just sort of left this Afghan in mid air, walked over and he says, who have you made best of breeding standards? And I said, a black bitch, apparently her name is Spitfire. He said, I love you more than ever. And then he just went back to the, the Afghan and carried on <laughs> business as usual. Okay. Apparently, he yeah. had done something with the bitch and really rated her. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, tell me, um, uh, well, we have now asked about, about uh, the, the, this one special dog. Uh, out of all the judging assignments that you had in your life, would you say Westminster was the most, most exciting one? Um, absolutely, because you know, I mean, look, I've had some, I've had some great assignments. You know, I mean, judging all the groups and best in show at Midland Counties here in the UK was remarkable. Um, and there've been other best in shows around the world. The, the when I did best in show in um, uh, in Japan, <clears throat> um, in Tokyo a few years ago um, for Satoshi Best Show. That was just fabulous. But the, the whole Westminster thing, um, it was one of the last years when the breed judging was at the garden. So they hadn't taken it to the pier. And 
the the atmosphere around those reed rings, which let's be honest, were congested. I mean, some of the rings were a bit small, but I mean, I remember, um, and I had a fabulous assignment because I had, you know, the poodles and Pekingese and Papillons and Pugs and Pomeranians, Bichons and whatever. Um, when you get in the middle of the ring, and I'm talking specifically now about at Madison Square Garden, and I was extremely blessed in having as my ring stewards, Susan Sprung, who is a dear, dear friend of many years, and Ed Bivin, who is, you know, a judge of the highest caliber and someone who I've had long-term respect for. They were my ring stewards and, and thank God I had their support because the sense of occasion got to me and you know when they play the national anthem and everyone stands up you know with the hand on their heart it's i mean it is so emotional and you get completely yes. overwhelmed and you're just getting through the national anthem and you look around the ringside and it's like this who's who of American dogdom, and not necessarily American dogdom, because they're there from all around the world. And you think, my God. And I mean, I remember saying to Susan, you know, I feel sick. She said, you'll be fine, you'll yeah. be fine. But I mean, yeah. the, Pug, Pugs was the first breed I did, and I swear to God, I never saw the first six dogs, because I was still trying to just get, pull myself together and, and and that, I mean, yeah. and, and that, that was so funny because there were lots of, lots of pugs being shown that day. And, you know, look, I get all the magazines, I see all the pictures, I know all the handlers. So I had lots of these dogs, you know, with winning records and a couple of overseas visitors who would very kindly sent me photographs of their dogs and handlers well in advance, you know, which was, you know, much appreciated. Um, didn't I do them a scrap that. of good. Um, <laughs> and, and I ended up with this, I thought, quite spectacular young male, shown by this lady who, with all due respect to her, was like, I thought she was just going for a walk in the park. And she sort of went around and the little dog went with her. And, um, when we were doing when when I, I when I gave her the ribbon for best she didn't seem particularly excited um and I said well you know as I mean obviously he was a champion because at that point they all had to be champions to enter the garden so I said as you know as has he done much winning and um she said well uh he won the Pug National when he was 14 months old. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. And I, I said, do you happen to know who was judging? And... Um, who it was? Oh, yeah, she says that. It was, um, it was Mr. Bivin. Okay. So, was, when, <laughs> so we've the, done the pic yeah. when we've done the pictures, I go back to the table. And, of course, Eddie is sat there, like, with this grinning like a Cheshire cat. And I said to him, Eddie, nobody is ever going to believe that, you know, I had no idea that this, this is your pug yeah. national discovery with this. Lady. Anyhow, subsequently, the dog was taken over by Linda Rowell. Um, and she handled him to endless best in show. I mean, he, 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 he built up a formidable record. Rufus. Rufus was his call name. Yeah. Okay, Valentina is giving me a sign that we are now almost two hours uh, long, and that uh, but I, we have only three questions. But there are so many. We have questions. only three questions. There are so many questions. Yeah, yeah, well, you obvious know. questions you have now. Yes, yes, but you see how it goes easily uh, into into interesting stories and everything. Um, so let's try to to have these uh, last few questions answered. 
um, a bit uh, a bit shorter. Um, I want to ask you one thing because uh, let's say it's it's in a way personal to me, and uh, and um, in a way probably it's personal to you. Um, I remember when Lee Scottridge was judging in Split a few years ago, and uh, when I was driving her um, to the airport, she said to me. Uh, can I ask you a question? And I said, yes, of course. She said, what is it that you do to Andrew when he's in split? Because that's not the Andrew Brace I have known for so many years. That's completely another person. So what yeah. is so special about, about split that makes you a, a completely a, a different person? Well, <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting point. It, I Listen, you know, I mean... You invited me to split, you know, from the early from the early days, and um, I instantly, you know, I mean, I, I I don't know whether it was my first visit to Croatia or if I've been to Croatia before, um, but anyhow, I mean, I I, I love the country and I love the people. Split, look, I don't need to do a promotion for Split. Everybody knows around no, the world. No, no, definitely not. That, that Split, yeah, that definitely split not. is special. Um, because of the time of year, because of the weather, because of, of you and the team you have around you. Um, I'm in, like, the best frame of mind it's possible to be. And, okay, then yeah. in, recent, in recent years, I've been coming out to help you look after the judges at the hotel. I love the hotel. I love I love the, the family um, who run the hotel, and um, yeah, I mean, every everything falls into place to put me in as good a frame of mind as I possibly could be. So yeah. how could I? But when when we are, yes, when when we are on that subject, um, and I'm sure you heard the, of it. Um, Sometimes, you know, if I would, you know, because I, I see you in a completely different way than, than many other people. Um, sometimes people who don't know you personally, who have seen you only um, passing by or, 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 um, or something, you know, they didn't have any, any interaction with you. Sometimes they can get the impression that, let's say, you are arrogant or that you are not interested to be involved with other people or whatever. Why do you think yeah. is that? Because that's not, that's not you. Well, I, I, I can, I, if, if you want me to be brutally frank, I will give you the answer to the question. It's because when I came into this sport very, very young. And not that anyone would ever believe it. I am actually, by nature, a very, very shy person. And when, yes. I, got involved in, when I got involved in the dog game, I realized that if I was going to survive, I would have to build some kind of veneer if I wasn't going to get massacred. And it was it was a deliberate attempt on my part that I did establish this kind of aloofness around me. It was a defense mechanism, basically. And you know, okay. people 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 who people who have become friends are the people who have got through that and seen that underneath yeah. there is actually a soft center. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, look, okay. I, I'm well aware of my, I, I am well aware of my shortcomings. I am well aware of coming across sometimes as being a little bit arrogant and and aloof, and mea culpa. I I hold my hands up. Yeah. But you know the the the, 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 pe yeah. the 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 people the people who um who get through it over 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 the time over the years um become very very good friends and let's be honest all my lifelong friends you know we mentioned andrew reynolds the other earlier on friends for 40 years all my lifelong friends are friends who've come from the dog world yes some of them have fallen yeah. by the wayside okay. along the way but you know so be it yeah okay three last questions very short answers uh, and let's say uh, very very easy questions. Um, first question: uh, If ever again in your life you would decide to have a dog again at home, which breed would it be? If I had a dog again at home, 
which which breed would it be? Yes. Which which breed it would be? Um, it would probably have to be a Pekingese again. Okay, perfect. Listen, second question. If you could go back in time, yeah, what would be one thing? What would be one thing that you would like to change about your life? What would be one thing that I would like to change about my life? Um, probably the fact that I sort of just put weight on as soon as I look at food. I would love to be one of these people who could just eat anything and remain, not like <laughs> twig like, but you know, sort of like, sort of well covered, but not skinny. Because yeah, well, I was. I will All not actually life, thinking that to, to be. Yeah, I was. I was not actually thinking that you answered to me. What would you like that the God has changed about you or the nature? But what would you like to change? But okay, I will accept it as the answer. And then the last question. And before you answer the last question, I want to say that uh, because we have gone for over now a little bit over two hours, there has been um, a few questions there, and. Um, I think that it would be nice uh, in the next few days if we can um, if we can try to answer these questions and make a short video and, and publish it on on Facebook and and um, on on the website of the Grooming Land um, and also um, if we have time uh, at the end of this uh, if Christian has just can just play these videos and then we will uh, I will ask you later on just to, to make a short uh, short. Uh, um, comment on them and we will publish also that later not not to go too long anymore so the last question last question for today is what would be your biggest wish for the future of the sport my biggest wish for the future of the sport i think possibly for for the concept of purebred dogs to return to having some kind of value in in the eyes of like the pet owning public when pedigree dogs were something to be treasured and valued and not just ridiculed because they're riddled with hereditary problems and why don't we buy a labradoodle because it'll be much healthier you know, I, I yeah. think if we had if we had that kind of um, return of values amongst, you know, the general population, that in turn would be a good investment into the continuation of the sport. OK, Andrew, uh, thanks a lot for accepting this. Um, I have found it very interesting and uh, I mean, I'm sure we could we could have gone on for for much longer, but uh, we have done almost two hours, and I think it has been incredibly uh, interesting and inspiring. And I think people have also uh, met a, a little bit different Andrew than what they have uh, some of them probably expected. Um, I'm very grateful to you for for joining me here, and uh, we will answer some questions and make these comments on the videos. That we have received and i hope it was not so bad i hope i have not been so bad and we can co continue to be friends after this actually you were remarkably well behaved yes i think, yes, you, I I think you'd so been bad. i think you'd been naughty because you'd been sort of like winding me up a little bit yes you've been making <laughs> me you'd been you've made me anticipate you being naughtier than you were yeah you see how nice i was Okay, you were very Christian, nice. I don't know if we can manage if we can manage to see this video for the end that people can see them and then later on we'll, we will make comments. Andrew will make comments on, on the videos that he has received. Okay, let me see, but I, I think I don't have them anymore. So uh, what happens now? Working. But um, thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, we can add them later also too. So. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot, everybody, for watching, and see you next Friday at the same time. I will, um, in the next two days, you will find out who will be my next guest. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Joanna, and uh, 
uh, we see each other soon again. Sounds good. Bye. Thank you all.